Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with knife steel guru, Laren Thomas. Laren has a PhD in metallurgical and materials engineering and developed different kinds of steels for the automotive industry, but his true passion is blade steel. He gained fame through his deep diving website, Knife Steel Nerds, and his complex and innovative understanding of the chemistry of steel. Recently, he distilled his profound knowledge of knife steels into a book, and currently, a super steel of his own concoction is being produced by Crucible Industries. Laren was one of my first guests on the podcast, episode number 13, and it's a pleasure to have him back to talk about all the exciting developments that have occurred since. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell. And while you're there, check out my knife close-up videos. Thursday Night Knives, that's our live stream, and the other great interviews with makers and personalities that make the knife Ooh, excuse me, that make the knife world happen. <laughs> if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to support the show while enjoying exclusive opportunities and content, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Laren, welcome back to the podcast. It's good to see you. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, there we go. <laughs> well, it's good to see you, man. Uh, as we were talking about beforehand, I bumped into you at the Demco Knives booth at Blade Show 2021, and uh, I heard I heard speak of Magna Cut, and I was like, wait a second, is Andrew Demco making knives with Magna Cut? And then I was like, who's this guy? Oh, it's it's Laren. And, uh, it's you me. Agreed to come, <laughs> and you agreed to come back on the show. Uh, it's great to have you here, man. Since you were here last, a lot of things have happened um, mm -hmm. for you and your career and all the exciting things. But before we get to any of that, uh, just in case people didn't listen to episode 13 way back when, um, tell me how you got into knife steel and how you became, well, such an expert. Yeah, well, I got into knives from my dad, who is Devin Thomas. He's known for making Damascus steel, known for making stainless Damascus, and for making kitchen knives. Uh, so that's what his his whole career was, the only source of income for our family uh, when I was young, from as far back as I can remember. Uh, so when I was a teenager, he took me to a couple knife shows. He took me to a hammer in or two. And uh, there I had an opportunity to talk to more of the knife makers and and hear from them and they would talk a lot about the steels they were using the heat treatments they were using and uh and so i got more interested in that side of it and i would talk to my dad and he'd give me books and articles to read and uh then i decided to pursue a career in, in metallurgy so i got my phd in in metallurgy and uh i, I really enjoy what i'm doing with automotive sheet steels and their development, but I, I wanted to to do more stuff with with knife steels because that's what originally got me interested in metallurgy. Uh, and so, yeah, that, it, that that's my story. So, well, basically, I mean, a lot of people get interested in things, but they don't become doctors in them, so to speak. So, <laughs> you're 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 a you're a PhD in metallurgy and materials engineering, uh, mm -hmm. like. Were you, I mean, so that's really, really taking it and, and running with it. Were you always predisposed to science and, you know, chemistry, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I did pretty well in school as a kid, uh, and I liked science classes, but I didn't grow up dreaming of being some kind of scientist. I didn't think I was smart enough to do that. Uh, and I, I was in a small school, um, so yeah, I went to junior college. It, it's not like I was on, on track to be a, a superstar or something. Um, and I didn't know what my degree was gonna be in. I, 
I took an, an intro to C++ coding class in junior college, and I really liked that, and I considered uh, doing coding or, or programming. Uh, but then my dad had some health issues, and I ended up working for him for a year, and that gave me a lot of time to think about what I wanted to do. And uh, I'd also taken a math class that I really enjoyed, and uh, that gave me confidence that I was capable of doing math, which I wasn't sure about in, in high school. Uh, so, so that confidence and that year spent not going to school uh, allowed me to evaluate you know, what do I want to do. And I decided, hey, I figured out how to do math in junior college. I can just go get an engineering degree, piece of cake. <laughs> and then uh, I learned engineering school was much harder than, than junior college, but it, it worked out. And uh, you know, by the time I was getting to the end of my bachelor's degree, you know, I was excited to go get a real job. But then I thought, well, what I was really interested in always was developing new steels. And really to do that, you have to get a higher level degree, bachelor's degree, metallurgists typically aren't able to get those kind of jobs. And so I, I was able to go to Colorado School of Mines and get my PhD in metallurgy. And that's how I got a job in developing new automotive steels. So how, well, before I get to, I, I want to find out a little bit about automotive steels, but um, mm -hmm. You know, you your your passion seems to be or is obviously blade steels and knife steels in particular. Um, why? I mean, where? In other words, why why not satisfied with any steels? What is it about knives? Is it because your dad was doing it, or do you have a do you have an undying love of knives? Oh, of course, I love knives. I, I mean, it's kind of hard to separate what you're exposed to versus what you decide to become interested in because you're interested in what you're exposed to. I mean, Tiger Woods was playing golf when he was three years old because of his dad, but he also learned to love golf at some point, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, it's hard to separate the two. So I was around knives and and with my dad going to these shows and, you know, at first it's like, oh, I, I don't care. I mean, this is what my dad does. And then uh, it was really the science side of knives that brought me in. And of course I grew to appreciate a lot of different types of knives. Uh, I, I love kitchen knives, especially because, you know, you use kitchen knives a lot right. Right. Uh, versus some other types of knives. Um, you know, like a self-defense knife, you don't have many opportunities for self-defense necessarily, um, at least if you're in the good neighborhoods. Uh, and But a, a kitchen knife, you know, you have a lot of occasions to, to use them. And I, I'm also a sucker for a, a good uh, gentleman's Damascus folder, uh, in part because of being around my dad. I see a lot of Damascus, um, and and I, you know I, I know what good and bad Damascus is, or at least I have opinions on what good and bad Damascus is. Um, so even at the Blade Show, I bought a a new uh, Cliff Parker folder with some some fun uh, picture mosaic in it. That was a a dream of mine to be able to afford one of those knives, wow. and so. And I started talking to my wife, you know, putting out the feelers on like, hey, what if I, I drop some money, <laughs> you know, on, on a high end folder? Um, and she's like, well, it's your money, you know, because I, I make some money off of my, my book, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I splurged on, on that knife. That was really exciting. I guess I should have brought it with me to this. Uh, Ooh, podcast. Yeah. It, it's uh, upstairs right now. <laughs> <laughs> Take oh, us yeah, on a tour I, of the house. Yeah, I love I love knives. So, you know, I'm I'm buying knives, using knives, sharpening knives. So That's funny that you say uh um about the kitchen knives and the and the self-defense knives. I have a chest full of knives that I just barely use because I'm so into their design and and you know, there are, a lot of them are the, these sort of self-defense knives you you speak of tactical knives. That's just my my taste. We have some a few good kitchen knives, but I haven't spent money on the kitchen knives that we use daily, uh, like I have on the knives that that sit in the chest. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't disparage any particular type of of knife. I mean, I have knives that could be called tactical knives or self defense knives, but there there's surprising separation between different uh, portions of the knife industry. I mean, uh, like guys making swords, guys making tactical folders, guys making kitchen knives. They're kind of in their own product category or industry within the industry and yeah. sometimes you know major guys out in the knife world you think certainly they've met or talked to each other about something uh really don't know that much apart from maybe just the name of, of the other one you know so it can be surprising sometimes right uh so you mentioned uh that being you know growing up 
under your dad's tutelage or just around your dad and and him making Damascus steel and and knives from them that you sort of developed a uh, a knowledge of what good Damascus is and uh, how how do you discern? Uh, well, there's a lot of things. I mean, some of it is personal taste. Just you look at the the pattern that they've developed and you just don't like it. You're like, okay. oh, what were you thinking here? Like, it's so gaudy, you know, or the layer count is very low and, and looks too coarse for my taste. Or they use too many layers and looks too fine for my taste. Or they did some picture Damascus and the pictures just look really uh, distorted because the forging wasn't done square. Uh, but you can also see things like, uh, you know, voids or inclusions in the steel. Still sometimes if it's poorly made. Uh, or you can see uh, when the layers are very fuzzy, it means that they overheated the steel. Uh, and so you no longer have sharp lines, sharp distinction between the different steels. Uh, so yeah, there, there's lots of different elements that can go into what makes good or bad Damascus. So some of it, I admit, is is personal taste. That's interesting because uh, uh, a listener recently sent me a um, uh, a knife from Pakistan made of Damascus steel. And I've always had my opinions about uh, knives from Pakistan. Um, you know, th there are a lot of them and they're, and they're generally, uh, you know, quite cheap. And I'm not trying to uh, cast aspersions on any culture or whatever. But uh, the knives that, that have made it into my hands from Pakistan have been cheap and, and, and such. And this uh, Damascus blade, I'm like, I don't know much about Damascus, but I can just kind of tell. And it was the... It was the there are little pits in it, and there's there are different textures, yeah. uh, uh, and I think that maybe that has to do with industrial, you know, trying to industrialize the 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 process. And it seems like Damascus steel is kind of a an intimate process when it comes to making steels. Yeah, there's different levels of how handmade the Damascus is, uh, though you don't always get a full picture of the process because some of it is is secretive, or at least the the guys aren't doing full video production, you know, of an exact how-to. Uh, you know, a company like Damasteel, they're a little bit bigger than some of the other Damascus makers, and and they they have a little bit more of an industrial process, though I. I don't say that to to say that they don't have a handmade product or that you shouldn't buy it or or something, but um, you know they're a little bit more regimented in in what they're doing. Um, uh, and then there there's individual bladesmiths where they're using borax flux and they're doing a lot of of cutting and restacking and and that's a very labor intensive process. So you know there's a lot of of different ways you can make Damascus and so yeah, looking at at Dama steel makes steel versus a bladesmith using a stack up of 1084 and 15 and 20 and having to cut and restack a few times with borax. It's, it's going to look very different. Hmm. Uh, I, I feel like uh, the, um, the show uh, forged in fire has, has opened my eyes up to different um, things you can make Damascus steel out of in different processes. Uh, it's funny because my wife and I watch that show uh, regularly and, you know, Whenever anyone has to make a canister Damascus and they bring out the whiteout, we're like, haven't you seen this show before? Don't use the whiteout. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, uh, it, it seems like a cool process. I mean, maybe someday when I retire, uh, retire, I'll give it a try. So automotive sheet steels. I mean, mm -hmm. okay, so now that seems like it's probably something like the polar opposite of making a Damascus steel. Uh, tell me about what it's like developing these kind of steels and 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 what the need in autom in the automotive industry is for ever new steels yeah there's a lot more steel development going on in automotive than there is in tool steel and knife steel um that's part of why i'm in that that industry as a profession there's just more jobs available it's still not a huge you know career there's a uh, not a lot of people with the same job as, as i have um, I probably know a good number of them. Uh, but the reason why there's so much development is because there's constant competition and constant pushing of, of boundaries with, with automotive. So one thing is that uh, auto automotive makers are looking at moving to aluminum in certain applications, especially on the outer body. You might remember the Ford F-150 uh, has an aluminum outer body. Now they can't, they're still not making the, the actual structure of the vehicle out of steel, but uh, where they can lightweight in in areas that don't require a lot of strength, um, they can use aluminum. 
uh, in, in the area of steel where we are always pushing for more performance or higher strength or higher ductility or, or both a lot of times is in that structure of the vehicle. So they, they want to go higher strength, which allows them to down gauge. So they use thinner steel so that it weighs less for the same part. Um, and if they have higher strength steel, it can be thinner and still have the same strength to the component. Uh, to make the steel stronger, that almost always reduces the ductility or the formability. So it's harder to form the same complex part that they want to form when we're moving to higher strength levels. So we have to maintain ductility while also moving to higher strength. And that requires uh, you know, controlling the microstructure and including different phases. It usually means we're adding more carbon or more silicon or more other alloying elements. And when you add in those alloying elements, it also reduces the weldability of the steel. Yeah. And so... So the, the automotive companies or our end customers, they're asking for higher strength with the same ductility, with the same weldability. And of course, it's not 100% uh, possible, uh, but you know we're always trying to push for more. Um, and it, it's really hard because we're balancing all these different properties. It's got to be stronger with the same ductility and be just as weldable. And we have to be able to make it at our facilities. So there's a, a million different things that we're balancing uh, and timelines and my managers. And you know there's a there's hundred things you're juggling. God, I, I mean, I always knew, <laughs> I always knew that science was stressful in school, but I mean, geez, man, this, that, I mean, that sounds, uh, so you have the actual ability to make the steels that you're formulating on paper, so to speak, uh, right there where you work. Yeah, I work at U.S. Steel Research. It's in the Pittsburgh area um, in, in uh, the suburb is called Munhall uh, or Homestead. It's got like five different names. It's also called the Waterfront. Um, so there we have what we call our pilot operations where we can do a small melt of material like 300 pounds and sometimes we'll split that three different ways. So like you can do three different carbon levels, you know, you'll add your, your manganese, silicon, chromium, whatever, and then you'll do, you know, 0 0.15, 0 0.18, 0 0.21% carbon or something. So you, you find the right carbon level. So you make those ingots, then we have a big uh, hot mill where they heat it up hot, they, they hot roll it out. Uh, also, when you make sheet steel, you you hot roll it and then you coil it up while it's still pretty warm, and then it slow cools from there, so that it's nice and soft at the end. And so we'll we'll simulate in a furnace that slow cooling process at, as a coil. Uh, and then uh, we have very advanced uh, furnaces, uh, continuous annealing lines, um, either for a final cold roll product or for a galvanized product. Um, a lot of, of steel that goes into cars is, is zinc coated, galvanized or galvanealed, uh, which gives it corrosion resistance. Um, so uh, we, we then design the annealing or the heat treatment, as we would normally call it in knives, where we, we send it through this giant annealing furnace where it's heated up hot and cooled down and held at different temperatures to get the right microstructure. So uh, after we do all that simulation or pilot operations, we then have the, the furnace simulator where it can do all of those heating and cooling operations. And then we measure the mechanical properties on a small sheet. So then we've got a composition and, an, and a heat treatment procedure that got us the right properties that we wanted, you know, after much trial and error. Uh, and then we have to produce it in the actual mill in, you know, much, much larger quantities. Instead of a, a few hundred pounds, it's, you know, many tons. Um, and sometimes it, it, it isn't very easy to produce in the mill, despite the tests we do to make sure it should be possible to produce in the mill. And then sometimes you send it through your final furnace and, you know, it's, it's way softer than it was when you, when you, simulated it you know you got to figure out why or can i adjust for this can i compensate for this lower strength than i thought i was going to get and so yeah we we simulate things in in our advanced facilities at the research center and then we have very advanced lines where we uh do the final processing of the coils do you ever actually form um the steel that you're experimenting with or tr or developing into actual car parts and put them in test cars and that kind of thing? Or is it all just done kind of uh, uh, theoretically testing it? Uh, so, I mean, we, we always test the steel in in standard materials tests. So uh, a very common one is the tensile test where, where we take a, a rectangle of, of the steel and then we, we grind it into kind of a dog bone shape and then you pull it apart. And then you see how much stress did the steel take and how far did it stretch before it broke. And those are standard materials tests. Um, we will do some 
some tests on on actual parts will do what we call our crash test so we'll make like a um like a hexagon of, of the steel i'm using my hands to show mm -hmm. a hexagon uh and then uh, we've got a giant weight and it basically just smashes the steel under a fixed feed and uh, speed and force and then you know we see did it fold did it crack how much energy did it absorb kind of thing um we also have modeling engineers that will model you know based on those mechanical properties we measured will it handle this type of shape or this type of forming mm -hmm. and then go to customers and say hey you've got this part right here if you switch to our material you could go down to 1.2 millimeter thick instead of 1.4 and our our models show that it should form just fine you know they'll show the pretty picture where everything's green um you know or maybe slightly yellow at this sharp corner over here you know kind of thing uh, so we don't normally form the parts, but I, I work at the uh, the research and development center. We have an automotive uh, center where they'll sometimes do some more forming simulations and things. So. That's fascinating. And so you're doing that all day long, mm -hmm. and then um, and then you started KnifeSteelNerds.com. You know, sometimes you think of uh, the chef who's working around food all day doesn't want to come home and cook more food, uh, mm. they order out. But but you work in steel all day long in this theoretical space and then in this realistic space and you're testing and you're putting your brain to work on creating new steels. And then you come home and you started uh, uh, knife, knifesteelnerds.com. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're, you're all in, I mean, you're 100% immersed. Tell me about the birth of that site and then how it grew uh, you know, culminating in your book. Yeah, well, it, it they they look very similar on the surface. One is steel, and the other is steel. <laughs> so they, it looks like I'm just doing more of the same thing. But uh, they're very separate for me. One is that the microstructures we work with in automotive steels are very different. The compositions are very different. Um, and so you know, it's almost like working on titanium versus steel. They're hmm. they're that different from each other. Um, in, in knife steel, we focus a lot on carbide structure and high hardness, and we do neither of those things really for, for automotive sheet steels. Um, so that feels very different. And then also Knife Steel Nerds was, was originally and still to this day primarily about education. You know, I don't, I don't do a lot of educating for my job, though I do have to educate my managers quite frequently on what it is I'm doing. <laughs> That's not a slight on them, but, you know, no. good communication goes a long ways. It, instead of just you know the research engineers are just a black box we give you assignments and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't instead we can say you know we did this and we tried this and we tried that it wasn't working we're gonna try this next you know just uh, education is important no matter what your your field is you have to communicate what you're doing or there's just a lack of trust um you know they feel like you're you're trying to slow things down or pulling the wool over their eyes you know instead right. just be open and explain exactly what's going on and everyone feels a lot better uh, but uh, this is even more basic level education. I, I say basic, even though we we cover some pretty advanced topics on the website, depending on what you're interested in. Um, so it was. I see uh, knife makers. I talk to knife makers. I was I was pretty. I was frequenting blade forums a lot, for example, uh, and hanging out in the knife maker forum. So I see a lot of the questions that come up, the concerns people have. Uh, you know, people ask a lot of questions about what steel to use, how to heat treat steel correctly. And uh, so I would post in that forum and I'd give answers. I even tried writing up a sort of an article on blade forums where I, I wrote about what cryo is and how it works and how it doesn't work and what it does and, and everything. Um, and then a couple of days later, after my post, you know, was down to page two or three and people were no longer commenting on it, then someone started a new thread asking about cryo. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm just running on a hamster wheel, not getting anything done. On, on this forum, you know, you can answer people's questions, but it's just never ending questions, the same question over and over and over again on forums. Um, and that's just the how forums work. People come and go, um, new people come and they ask the same questions that were asked last year and the year before that and 20 years ago. Uh, and so I thought if I started a website, then, you know, 
things would be a little more permanent, or at the very least on the forum, I can link to something I already wrote up instead of writing another 3000 words again. <laughs> right. And it's also like uh, on a forum, it's like, oh, well, who's this guy? He thinks he knows so much about steel. <laughs> Whereas when you have your own thing and you have a, it, your own site and you have a chance to establish your own reputation and, and there's a, a permanent archive there that people can just search through. Okay. This guy does know what he's talking about over and over, as opposed to going to a forum and it, you, you know, you might remember that username. You might not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, uh, so how long did it take to? I mean, you look at Knife Steel Nerds. It's 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 a massive, um, you know, resource. It's a it's a tome, yeah. It's too big. Mm -hmm. Well, but I, I don't I don't know. But I would imagine <laughs> if I were if I were a knife maker, uh, it it would be the the sort of too big that gives you a lot of confidence to know that it's there, man. Cause when mm -hmm. I need to go and find out about annealing or when I need to really know about cryo, I'll go there mm -hmm. and I know that it's there. Not that you have to read every page, you know? Um, so how long did it take for people to catch on to this? It's a, you've got a lot of subscribers and you you know, you're popular across the knife world. How long did that take? Yeah, it's hard to give a like a date or a number on, you know, this is when it took off. I mean, if, if you look at my my analytics on from my website, it's basically just a steady growth over time. I think I, I've plateaued <laughs> at this point. But, uh, you know, just a, if I'd have a popular article that would bring in some more people and just the the number of, of readers continues to go up. So, I mean, I had I had relatively famous knife makers saying great job or, you know, this was an awesome article pretty much from the beginning. Um, so I, I don't know if there's any real date I can say like, oh, this is when I made it. Yeah. You know, uh, Oh, I had a very popular article on uh, Catra edge retention where I, I tested uh, 48 different steels or something. So I mean, that that was a big one. But I had other big articles before that. So, um, you know, I, I try to try to get excited when when I have a popular article or, or people are very excited about some experiment that I did. So, um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't say this is when I made it. No. Right. There there is. Um... Oh boy, to say movement is not the right term. There were there were a group of people over the past couple of years um, doing um, doing hardness tests of big companies' products. You know, oh, you say mm -hmm. you have CPM twenty V twenty CV. We're gonna we're gonna test this steel and uh, and see if it's really what you're claiming it is. Uh, is that the kind of thing that uh, you've ever been into, or or are you do you feel like you're operating on a different you know. <laughs> well, I don't want to say that I'm above anyone else. That's not what I mean. I mean. That's not what I mean. <laughs> what I mean is like, I, I don't think you're out to disprove anyone or, or point your finger, but uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't review heat treatments or steel selections or individual knives at all. Um, it, it, you know, so there are guys that will, you know, test hardness or composition or do rope cutting on, on specific knives. And that's great. You know, uh, it's just not what I do. Uh, you know, so I, I do more experiments on individual steels and I, I test different heat treatments and, and I test edge retention and toughness and corrosion resistance and all of those things. But I I don't test, um, you know, the hardness of a Spyderco PM2 in mm -hmm. S30V. I don't do that generally. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, some people do it on purpose to try to be, uh, you know, try to stir up controversy like, oh, Spyderco advertised this was 62. I tested it was 59. And uh, w whether or not it, it was true, uh, you know, just they're they're doing it, uh, saying that they're giving information to the consumer, but really they're looking for controversy to bring in in viewers. And that's part of the reason why I avoid it. And also just it, there's an unlimited number of things to look at and figure out, oh, this isn't up to snuff or whatever. And but it, it, in the end, it's just not my interest. I there's too many variables with individual knives. If you're doing rope cutting with a Spyderco, whatever, an S30V versus a Benchmade other knife and 154, you can't compare the steels or the heat treatments because the edge geometry is completely different. Um, and just so you're you're not comparing things you want to compare. You're comparing a, a hundred different variables between different knives instead of narrowing down to one or two variables at a time, like I prefer to do, because I want to know the engineering principles. You know, the the steel selection, edge geometry, the different heat treatment variables, all to end up with different results. 
And when you're reliant on the knife companies changing all of those things at once, comparing each other, it's just not possible to figure out what controls what. So, so you just uh, listed three things, the steel, the heat treatment, and the geometry. And that's the mm -hmm. subtitle of your book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Knife, knife Engineering. Mm -hmm. I brought that. it here just, just for you. By the way, I, I love the <laughs> Bowie knife on top, uh -huh, <laughs> but, but that's just me. Uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that. I appreciate that uh, for bringing it out. So our, it's the subtitle of your book. Would you say that those are the three um, mm, most valuable, the three primary uh, uh, variables in, in creating a successful cutting knife? Yeah, and of course, there's a million sub variables, and people rank them in different ways. Uh, some people call it, you know, three pillars or the three legs on the three legged stool kind of thing, where you want all three to be excellent, of course. Um, some people put too much importance on on heat treatment. They'll say, you know, like the heat treatment matters more than the steel or something along those lines. Um, that's not 100% true. Like steels have their range of properties that are possible, and you can't turn a low wear resistant steel into a high wear resistant steel just because you heat treated it in a fancy way, for example. Uh, the geometry is the most important. I mean, you can have pretty lousy steel and if you give it a nice robust geometry, you can hack it through some cinder blocks, you know, like nobody's business. You've seen this on Forge and Fire, I'm sure, um, where they, they heat treat the knife very poorly, but it still makes it through a lot of those tests. Um, it just, if you put the right geometry on it, it can handle a lot of things. Um, and if you make it nice and thin, it'll slice well. And you got to have the hardness to be able to to handle that thin edge and the toughness. Um, but if you want a knife that cuts really well and cuts a long time, you got to have thin geometry. So let's talk about the book. How did that come about? Was um, here's here's my theory. <laughs> okay, All my right. theory is that you had such a sprawling uh, amount of information on your website that that you needed to boil it down into a quickly searchable um, or or condensed crystallized version of it, which is kind of funny to to think of uh, going in that direction because usually people go the other direction. Printed material blossoms into uh, internet material. But okay, that's my theory. So tell me about uh, coming up with this book and and the process of writing it and uh, mm -hmm. and whittle, whittling things down to a book. Yeah, well, before I started the website, I thought about doing a book. I mean, I, I grew up on books. Like I read uh, Professor Verhoeven's book that he wrote on on metallurgy for bladesmiths. And, and so, you know, that was what I was used to. And like, well, real serious people, they do books. Um, but, you know, I was like, well, doing a book, like I have to get a publisher and you have to write the whole thing at once. And like, let, let's just start small. We'll have a free website where people can go and read whatever they want whenever they want. Um, it'll be easy to search for and find, and let's just do a website. But like you said, after a couple of years of writing for this website, there's just a hundred articles and hundreds of thousands of words. Um, and so someone that just shows it to my website and scrolls down to the first article, they're like, what even is this? Where, how do I, I, I have no idea what Laren's even talking about. And in the articles I have linked links back to older articles, you know, so I, I say, oh, and then I austenitize the steel at 1450 degrees. Well, austenitizing, if you want to learn about that, cl click on this link. And I, I would just have all these links. Um, and but I'd look in my analytics and no one's clicking on the links. So I know that people just show up and they, they say, I am overwhelmed. I don't know what this is about and uh, and leave. Um, so I thought, well, let's just write a book and we can write things from start to finish, you know, in a, a natural progression where if you read it from beginning to end, um, I won't cover anything you don't understand, you know, before you get to it. Yeah. Um, and you can skip around some of my book. I try not to go too crazy with, you know, you've got to read chapters one, three, five, six, seven, and eight before you understand chapter 11 kind of thing. I avoided that the best I could. Um, and just make sure if you read this book, then you'll know everything on, on my website. You'll know everything I'm talking about. Um, and uh, the, the reviews on the book have been extremely positive. My, my biggest concern all the time is just someone to read something I wrote and say, I don't know what that meant. Um, I want anybody to be able to read things I write and get something out of it. And, and the reviews have been so positive. It's been, it's been amazing uh, talking about how they learned a lot of things and that it was at their level and it wasn't too far beyond them. 
so you know, my goal is to educate, not to to blitz you with a lot of fancy words. Um, some knife makers, when they write about heat treating or steel, their goal is just to show you that they know more than you do. Um, you know, I know about the steel and the heat treatment. You don't worry about it. I'll show you all these fancy words. You'll know I know what I'm talking about, though they may not. Um, and that's really their goal when they're they're writing about it to establish themselves as an expert. I don't need to establish myself as an expert. I'm confident in myself. <laughs> so I, I, my goal is just to educate and to learn. I do tons of experiments. Those aren't just to back up things I already wanted to say. I'm learning. Um, a, a big reason why I started the website was just to answer all the questions that I had, um, things that either weren't studied or weren't studied enough or you know maybe it's some in some obscure paper or book from you know 1905 but i'm never going to find it um so you know let's do the studies and let's find out you know how to heat treat the steel in the best way um which seal is going to cut the longest uh, what does cryo do realistically you know in an edge retention test um all those things i want to know and i'm still doing experiments well you'd think uh, from the subject of the book and and how how deep it goes that it would be just for knife makers but i know you know amongst my set knife collectors and and just knife enthusiasts the book is really popular i mean a lot of people have that book just to learn more about their hobby you know of yeah. collecting knives so i think that's a i mean that's a pretty interesting I, I would say you're you're successful with this because you have a book that has a lot of technical information but it's drawing in people who who aren't using that technical information for their craft they're just using it for their to further their knowledge and their hobby um so yeah, a lot of things are are relevant to the collector i mean yeah. you know do you want a higher hardness knife um what does geometry do you know what can i do to the knife as the end user should i sharpen it thinner or should i give it a little more obtuse angle um, you know, so what knives should I look for? What type of knives do I want for my type of cutting? And how, what do I do with that knife once I have it? Those are, are things you can learn. And you'll learn things you're never going to use, like you said. But if a, if a knife maker tries to blitz you with fancy words, you'll know if he knows what he's talking about. Right. Um, so I want to talk about Magna Cut. You have mm -hmm. your, uh, a steel of your own concoction and and uh forgive the term i just don't know what a better term is for it but <laughs> but you you know obviously you know what you're talking about and like you said you are an expert and and i don't mean to say like you said you're an expert i mean obviously you are and so who better to than than a knife enthusiast who is also an a, a professional expert and a doctor in metallurgy to come up with a steel tell me about the story of magna cut and uh you know how it came to be well, one of the biggest things that attracted me to the metallurgy of knife steels from the beginning was the release of S30V. Though so S30V came out around 2001, which was right before I started getting into to knife steels. Um, and so S30V was really exciting because they were they were advertising it as a steel developed just for the knife industry. Um, and they were talking about it being tougher and, you know, being a stainless with better properties than had been achieved in the past. And, and those things all really intrigued me, you know, like that you can develop a new steel or a new product that does things that previous products couldn't do uh, using your, your, you know, experimental work and your knowledge of metallurgy that that was either better than the next guy or at least that you went in a different direction to achieve a different set of properties than than they had in in the available products. And so when, like I said, when I was finishing my bachelor's degree, I said, well, what always excited me was developing something new, you know, pushing the envelope and having a new product. I don't want to be a, a, a quality metallurgist who's just making sure that everything's meeting the specs from some other guy that developed mm -hmm. it. I want to push the envelope and have the new cool stuff, um, you know, doing new things that that haven't been done before in steels. And, and so when when I was doing stuff for knife steel nerds, I'd really kind of avoided the idea of of developing new steels unless I had something that I thought would be new and fresh and push the envelope and move things in a new direction. Um, and initially, when I when I started playing with ideas or using modeling software and stuff on steel, I I would move around the elements and and it just it wasn't it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. Like, okay, well, you know, there, there's a reason why we have the products that we do, and that's because this is what steel can do. <laughs> but uh, eventually I, I had some epiphanies about 
changes we could do to the composition to make steel that it would have the same performance as the best non-stainless grades. And when I say the best non-stainless grades, I don't mean 1095. Um, I mean like CPM Crewware, CPM 4V, Venetis 4 Extra. Those are powder metallurgy non-stainless steels with really high combinations of toughness and wear resistance. Um, a better combination of those properties and is available in stainless steels. That includes M390, S30V, uh, LMAX, um, much better than those steels, but they are not stainless. And really, when we're talking cutlery steels, knife steels, we want corrosion resistance. We would prefer to have it. Um, in a tool and die situation, they don't care really about corrosion generally. But uh, in knives, we would prefer to not have to baby the knife, um, and we'd like it just to not rust. Uh, so. I wanted to make a stainless steel that had the properties of those best non-stainless steels. And uh, one of the the jumps forward that Crucible had made with S90V and then again with S30V is they reduced the chromium content. Uh, because steels like M390, they've got 20% chromium in them. But in terms of chromium going towards corrosion resistance, it's only about 12 or 13% rather than the full 20. And the rest of that chromium is just going to chromium carbides. And the chromium carbides are not as effective for getting your high properties as just a vanadium or niobium carbide. So a steel like CPM4V, it has only vanadium carbide. And that allows you to have uh, better properties than the stainless steels that have a lot of these softer chromium carbides in them. The chromium carbides are softer and larger the, they're larger, which reduces your toughness, and they're softer, so you get less wear resistance for a given amount of carbide. So you have the harder, smaller vanadium carbides, you get better properties. So all I did was reduce the chromium. That, uh, that, that, that's all you had to do is a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> you just uh, balance the other elements so that you get the right amount of carbon for hardness, the right amount of chromium for corrosion resistance. Yeah. Well, why do those other steels that you mentioned before, M390, et cetera, uh, use all the extra chromium in there if they're only really, using 12% of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, LMAX, S90V, M390, they were all developed in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and so they they took the most common stainless steel of the day, like 440C, and then they added more carbon and vanadium to boost the wear resistance. That's what they did with the powder metallurgy non-stainless steels. They added more carbon and vanadium and that really boosted the properties overall. The powder metallurgy allowed them to add more vanadium. Now with the stainless steels, that didn't work out that well because of all that chromium in there. They didn't get the same combination of properties. Uh, so there's not that much competition to make new stainless tool steels. And I think that's part of it. But even more recent steels like uh, Udahome Vanex came out just a few years ago. And they still had 18% uh, chromium in there, and even though not all of it is going towards corrosion resistance. And so I think in some ways they just have that stuck in their head is like when you make a stainless steel, you add a whole bunch of chromium and that's what you're supposed to do uh, rather than, than balancing the right carbon chromium level instead. So how do you ensure, <laughs> okay, this might be going way down. Uh, maybe this is going, uh, but how do you ensure that all of the chromium is being used? Like, how do you um, say you put in, you know, 18%, but you want it all to be used? How, how does one accomplish that? Yeah, it's all about balancing the elements. So like D2, for example, it's a non-stainless tool steel. It has more chromium in it than magna cut but it is much less corrosion resistant. And it's because it has too much carbon to be a stainless. So you add more carbon and it makes the chromium more likely to form with a carbide. It's pretty simple. Chromium and carbon make carbides. So if you keep putting more carbon in there, eventually that carbon will start eating up your chromium instead of allowing the carbides to dissolve in your heat treatment. But another steel with almost the same amount of chromium, uh, a steel like uh, AEBL or 420, they've got much less carbon with a similar level of chromium to D2, and so they are stainless and D2 is not. Uh, so a lot of it is just balancing the carbon with the chromium. Uh, you can add more carbon and you get higher hardness and less and less corrosion resistance and vice versa. Uh, but if you balance everything exactly right, you can get the, the right carbon chromium balance that, that you're looking for, for hardness, corrosion resistance combination.
Okay, so through your modeling, you figure out a way to um, sort of uh, take some of what you really like from the stainless steels, but also what you really like from some of these um, uh, super uh, powder metallurgy um, non-stainless steels. You kind of mm -hmm. figure out the recipe. So um, back here on Earth, how do you figure out how to get it made? I mean, how did you actually go about that process of, of having your, your brainchild become something mm -hmm. actually physical. Yeah, so I use my knowledge of steel, the history of, of knife steel development, um, and and some modeling software to dial things in the best I could. I put together a presentation uh, describing the steel design and why I thought it would work, even though the, the steel composition looks very wonky. I even checked the steel composition against uh, a, a former crucible metallurgist who designed S110V, and he told me he didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> It'll never work, kid. <laughs> it's like the chromium's too low. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's going to work because of this reason and this reason. He's like, oh, I could see that. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so uh, so that didn't give me that much uh, confidence. But, you know, uh, sometimes good ideas are, are not used for a reason. And that's because they, uh, you know, initially don't look correct. Um, so I put together this presentation. I had all my experimental work, uh, you know, because it's not just you you tell the the modeling software, hey, I want a steel that has this much edge retention and this much toughness and this much uh, hardness, whatever, and it spits out a composition for you. Um, you know, it can tell you a predicted uh, breakdown of, of phase fractions. So, like, you have this much austenite, this much of this carbide, this much of this carbide at this temperature, and then those phases have this composition. Um, so, you know, it'll tell you you have 0.4 carbon in solution and 11.1 chromium in solution, but you don't know what hardness and corrosion resistance that's going to give you unless you've got a bunch of experimental work on different steels. Um, so I showed them all my experimental work, like a big curve of carbon in solution versus hardness for a whole range of knife steels. And I'm like, okay, so this is the perfect spot right here where we're going to get 64 as quenched um, or, you know, we're going to get this level of edge retention because we're going to have these carbides. We're going to have this level of toughness because we're going to have this. Uh, we're going to have this level of corrosion resistance because this is how much chromium and moly we're going to have in solution. So I have all this experimental work, which confirms the the models um, saying that we're going to get these properties. So I present all of this to Crucible Steel. Well, first I sent them an email and I said, hey, uh, I've got an idea. <laughs> and then... Uh, let, let me give you a presentation. So I go to them and I present all of this. I'm like, and this is why this new steel is going to be way better than anything you've had before. Um, you know, Udahome and, and Bowler, they keep uh, crapping all over your product saying that theirs are the best with third generation powder metallurgy technology. This is going to put you back on top. Uh, it's going to be the best knife steel out there in terms of, of toughness, edge retention combination. Uh, it's going to match the, the properties of your best non-stainless steels. And uh, they agreed to to give it a try. So, and I I I don't know if I had more than one shot at it, but basically I had one shot at it. It, it mm -hmm. cost you know tens of thousands of dollars to make a test heat of steel, and I don't think they would have done that twice. <laughs> so, right. yeah, I, I I I I kept fiddling around with the design, you know, tweak it a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, waking up at two in the morning, worried like, oh no, I needed a little bit more carbon. You know, and and just freaking out. It you know, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Until, until we finally had it in hand to test it. So they make a test heat. Uh, that's what you called it, right? A test heat of steel. Yeah, I called yeah. it a test heat. It's still a full heat of steel. Um, Crucible went bankrupt in two thousand nine. Before they went bankrupt, they had this uh, research facility where they could do fifty pounds, five hundred pounds at a time. Uh, they don't have that research facility anymore. Now, when they test a new grade, they do a full production heat of it. Uh, the upside of that is, uh, you know, when you make 50 pounds of steel, sometimes it doesn't work out when you make 5,000 pounds of steel. Something changes in between your, your laboratory production and your full production. Now, with MagnaCut, the first test heat is a real production heat. If the steel works, the steel is going to work. Um, so that's the upside. The downside is, is your costs are much higher because you've got to do a full production run. Right. So, okay, you make this big production run uh, of uh, of Magna Cut. Um, how do you do? How did you determine whether it was a success or not? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I've generated a bunch of tests of, of knife steel with knife steel nerds. So we've got a standardized toughness test where we tested a whole bunch of different knife steels with different heat treatment conditions. Uh, I talked to, earlier about that giant Catra edge retention study I'd done. Um, so I've, I've tested more knife steels in, in edge retention than just about anybody especially in a controlled condition with the same edge geometry and the same sharpening on every single knife. Uh, I had a standardized corrosion resistance test. Uh, I had a standardized test for uh, maximum hardness and tempering to different hardness levels. So all I had to do was the same kind of test I was already doing with tons of pre-existing steels. I got you. I got you. So uh, you had a bunch of uh, knife makers, I should say a select group, not, uh, not a whole bunch, but you had a select group of knife makers who are very excited to get their hands on this. Um, did that uh, tell me a little bit about that and how you, how you chose those people and, and what you were, uh, you know, how you went about that. Yeah. What we were looking for in people to send steel to. Um, so the steel is produced by crucible and then sent to Niagara specialty metals for the hot rolling and annealing and final distribution. So uh, you have Crucible and Niagara Specialty Metals to thank for all of the CPM products. Uh, and they do a great job with distribution. Um, there's a lot of complaints in the knife industry about not being able to get steel from certain suppliers. Um, they just don't put the priority on, on knife steel production. But Crucible and Niagara do. That's why I went with them. So uh, having a pre-existing relationship with Niagara was a, a plus, uh, though not all of them did. Um, so some of them had, had already tested steel, uh, like S 45 VN was a product that Niagara and Crucible had come up with about a year before Magna cut, uh, cause I have really bad timing, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so that was a positive, uh, but the big ones were that, you know, they're established knife maker, they're experienced, they know what they're doing. You know, we're, we're not sending novices steel where they can't even tell the difference between different steels anyway. Uh, having experience with high alloy steels is also a positive. Um, you know, if they're used to working with 1095 and 5200, then the steel is going to be way outside of their wheelhouse. They're not going to be used to high wear resistant steels. And so that's going to be the main thing that they notice when working with it. Um, and also knife makers that had a track record for testing their knives, you know, guys that are doing cardboard testing or chopping through two by fours or, or that kind of thing where they can give good feedback because they've tested knives, they've chipped out edges, um, you know, they've dulled knives through different tests. Um, and they'll know when, when a, a steel is performing well or when it's hard to work. Now, a, a big concern is that I run it through my my battery of tests and it's got great toughness and great edge retention and everything. But then, you know, during hot rolling, it splits everywhere or the knife maker says it's terrible to work with. Um, you know, these are all possibilities. Sometimes there's deal breakers that you can't really foresee until they show up. And then you've just got, you know, a, a brilliant product that's dead in the water because it it's not going to work functionally in some way. Uh, so that, that was the big concern is that the knife makers would say it was hell to grind or, or, you know, something like that. All right. So what uh, kind of response back have you gotten? Uh, everybody loves it. Um, there are a few knife makers that don't, don't use uh, other vanadium alloy steels that still complain about hand sanding just if it's got vanadium in it it's not going to be a joy to hand sand it it just isn't and that that's a big deal to knife makers but they did report that it was easier to hand sand than a lot of those steels um even easier than s35 vn or s30 v oh, wow. and those are on the easier end of the spectrum when it comes to vanadium alloy knife steels so they said it was easy to grind um and the the larger knife manufacturers also reported great ease in, in grinding. So uh, Chris Reeve knives grindability is very important to them. Uh, you know, they want to have high precision ground products. And if the steel is burning up in, in grinding, it's just not going to work. Um, and so everyone reported that grindability was very good and finishability was good for the level of wear resistance. So those were really key things because um, I really want this to be a general use steel that can go and manufacture knives, not just custom knives. And right. so grindability was a big one. Um, and so the feedback has been great. Uh, performance feedback has also been great. It's not a steel really designed for ease and manufacture. That was just a, a happy accident. Uh, so the toughness has been really high. Um, you know, uh, Big Chris, he's a guy known for making big choppers and chopping through two by fours and other nasty things. And uh, with stainless steels, he normally doesn't make any knives over than like a six inch blade, but he's been making choppers out of out of Magna Cut. So it's doing awesome. 
Uh, so yeah, this this is something that you aim to spread far and wide, and I would imagine that is why you know yeah right I get it like you don't want to ruin your machines trying to trying to make you know fifty blades or 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 whatever. So what what do you think uh, in terms of a realistic timeline for those of us who are just interested in getting a knife with magna cut uh, with a magna cut steel blade? Do you have any sort of idea? when this will go a little more wide stream, mainstream? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, they've got 13,000 pounds of it at Niagara right now that they've been working through and hot rolling. And and a lot of that is is already been claimed by different knife companies and, and mid-size, you know, custom knife makers or mid-tech knife makers. So, I mean, it, stuff has been trickling out from the the initial knife makers that were able to get some so it's not like it hasn't been available at all but what we managed to make you know sold out pretty much immediately um so we've got more steel coming just it it's a gradual ramp up process where we're making as much as we can but uh the steel companies are backed up right now uh, just i mean it seems like the whole world is is struggling to make enough products for everyone to buy you know there's semiconductor shortages and automotive shortages and just everybody's behind on production. So uh, it's no different with steel. So yeah, I, I do get some questions like, when is the the every man able to get some of the steel as, as if it's like kind of an elite product or or outside of the scope of the average person to buy, but it's really just, you know, we're, we're ramping up production and it takes time, so. Well, that's great news. You mm -hmm. know, that's, that's good to hear, especially if you're under the impression that it's just some uh, fancy pants steel that you're never going to be able to afford kid you know <laughs> yeah. like uh, that that is that is cool um uh i was reading on your website about the interesting way you came up with the name can you uh can you talk a little bit about that yeah well i mean we ran through a thousand different names i talked to my dad i talked to some of my knife maker friends like sean houston um, and we would just throw out every name, you know, stupid names, good names, bad names, uh, really bad names. And uh, eventually I, I wanted to pay tribute to the company Vasco. Now they were they were very important to to tool steel development. They they invented steels like uh, M4, which of course we now know as CPM M4. They developed the steel Vasco die, which most people don't know is the composition of CPM 3B. Uh, they developed the steel Vasco wear, which is the composition of CPM crew wear. So they made all of these important contributions. Uh, and they have uh, they had a steel called Hypercut, which was uh, eventually named M42. It was one of the first steels that could be heat treated to 70 Rockwell. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was called Hypercut because in machining operations, you call it cutting. Um, even though we think of cutting very differently in, in knives. And they had a bunch of steels with cut in the name, but I really liked Hypercut. And I found this really cool ad from like the 60s or 70s, uh, you know, with like this space age style for Hypercut. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. I really want to call the steel Hypercut. Um, but Crucible was not excited about the name Hypercut because of like some potential trademark issues and like Hypercut in terms of Vasco, like that trademark was long gone, but there were some other unrelated products with named Hypercut and they were worried about trademark disputes. And I was like, fine. So I just start, you know, running through every other potential word that could go in front of cut, you know, like Supercut, you know, it's too much like Supercuts getting a haircut and, you know, yeah. but uh, so eventually we landed on Magna Cut. Uh, which I had a couple of concerns about the name, but eventually it it, it grew on me and, and it ended up being Magna Cut. So. I got to say, I love the name Magna Cut. It just makes you want to put on an announcer's voice and say it. It just has a good and, and, and also it just evokes, you know, an intrepid steel that's mm -hmm. just going to, you know, just keep cutting and cutting and do an awesome job. I don't know something about that. I just, I like the name. And then I saw, you know, the, the ad that you did or the, the sort of um, product sheet for it in that sort of sixties style or forties yeah, or yeah, 50s so, style. So I, I contacted my, my uncle Ralph Thomas. So he, he designed the cover of my book. He's a professional graphic designer and an illustrator. Um, and so the the style of, of the ads for Magna Cut are way different than the cover of my book, which I think shows his his versatility. Um, so I I sent him the ad of Hypercut. I also went and found some old like space age 60s advertising. Yeah. 
Uh, and I, I sent him a bunch of those and I'm like, this is the style that I'm looking for. And, and like, can you pull some inspiration out of this and, and make a 60s style space age ad, um, for, for Magna cut. And he was like, sure, no problem. Uh, and so this is what he came up with. You know, we've got like the, the wow and the, yeah. the finger pointing and, uh, he's got like the, uh, the newspaper where you can see kind of, kind of through the paper onto the backside and course he he made our little little knife grinding man yeah um so it looks awesome i i love it and you know i didn't make it so i i can say that it looks incredible um so yeah he, he's amazing and uh you know those ads don't really do much it's not like i'm putting ads in magazines or on tv or something it's just like well i loved this hypercut ad like let's do a cool ad for magna cut what will it be used for i don't know i'll just put it on my website oh man <laughs> make t-shirts and posters i would definitely Oh, we do get, have get a we have a Magna Cut T-shirt. Uh, I got a link on my website. Uh, I wish I had the link right offhand. Um, let, let me pull it up real real quick. So it's tpublic.com. and of course my computer is going all slow because we're we're talking over video. Okay, tpublic.com slash user slash knife steel nerds. So you can go there and you can get a, a Magna Cut shirt with the the grinding man on the back. Oh, cool. And is that the same as if you go to Knife Steel Nerds and you just go to where it says shop or T-shirts or something like that? Yeah, yeah. There's okay. a link on the main page that says T-shirts. Okay. And so that should be easy to find. If you're on mobile, you have to click on the little uh, three lines hamburger button right. to pull up the menu. But it, it shouldn't be that hard to find. Now, I think I make like $2 off a shirt. So, I mean, it. it I'm not making money off of shirts, really. But just uh, it, and if if you are, there's nothing wrong with that, Larry. <laughs> people were asking for t-shirts, and so I'm like, fine, let's do some t-shirts. So I talked to my uncle about you know putting together a couple images for front and back of the shirt, and so yeah, it looks pretty cool. So what can we expect from you um, in the future? Uh, do you, are you working on any? new steels you're like man i just came up with magna cut what do you what do you mean <laughs> but i mean is it is your mind constantly churning are you thinking of uh yeah uh, well, ever new? and i don't know where to start first um so i i've i can do a million different variations on on magna cut and i don't mean like oh we just tweak things here or tweak things there we can make vastly different products under the the same basis that i i took off of magna cut so when when I talked about the reducing chromium and, and having properties like a non-stainless, we can make any uh, non-stainless stainless. So 3V, 10V, 15V, 1V, they can all be stainlesses. Um, we can also change the balance of, of hardness corrosion resistance. So uh, the steel has very high corrosion resistance, better than M390 or 20CV, not quite to the level of Vanex or LC200N, which are like the gold standard saltwater steels, but that's not what my goal was. Mm -hmm. um, if we dial back the hardness some, MagnaCut can get to 64, 65 Rockwell if you want it. Uh, and then it's easy to temper back to the to the hardness that you want, like 61, 62, or whatever it is. Uh, we could make the steel top out at 62, 63 and get saltwater level corrosion resistance. Um, or we could dial back the corrosion resistance some and, and get it to be 65, 66 Rockwell. Um, that's probably less likely. I, there's probably not enough of a market for really high hardness stainless. But th those are just possibilities. The, the one that interests me the most is probably... Uh, doing a higher wear resistance version. Uh, a lot of enthusiasts seem to only care about wear resistance. With Magna Cut, I'm trying to promote more balanced pro properties and you know higher toughness, thinner edges, um, stuff like that. Uh, but after giving them what I think they need rather than what they want, uh, we can give them <laughs> what they want next. And uh, so we'll see if that happens. But I've got other projects, too, uh, with a couple of guys in, in Europe, uh, Tobias Hongler and Marco Gudemann. We're working on a, a forging steel, which is a very different design than, um, you know, a stainless powder metallurgy steel. So the, the design process is extremely different there. Uh, I'm working on, on conventionally produced steels uh, that has been listed on some of my charts as Niomax for years now and, and is not ready to go yet still <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh you know so uh that that's going for for more of uh the higher toughness range than um than magna cut is um you know i might have even talked about niomax on on your show 
a couple years ago. And yeah, we're still waiting on it. <laughs> so yeah, because uh, because uh, um, Magna Cut was just a glint in your eye. Uh, it obviously, wasn't named and wasn't a thing. But I remember you were talking about. Uh, you know, the, the steel, one of the steels you had in the offing. That... Yeah, I think that was Niomax. I don't think Magna Cut was even an idea yet. Uh, so it, it yeah, that things happened pretty quickly when it came to me proposing the steel um, to Crucible, where I had an idea and then I had a presentation to give it to Crucible shortly after. So that those are those things. Uh, I also have a, a new YouTube channel. So I released a video a week ago now or something uh, where I did a big set of experiments on different quenching oils. There's a lot of myths around quenching oils with knife makers, like what quenching oils are the best or the fastest or which ones are you supposed to use with which steel. So I did a big study on that. Uh, and I did a, a big YouTube video. I've avoided doing YouTube because it's a lot more work than doing articles. I only have so much time with a full-time job and kids and everything. Right. And uh, so doing a video is all of the work that it takes to do an article and then all of the work that it takes to film and edit things. Um, and it's also just annoying. Like I can do experiments without filming myself if I'm not doing YouTube. But if you've got to do it on YouTube, you got to have little clips of you, you know, putting the steel in the furnace, pulling it out right, and dumping it right, in the oil. Right. And it's just so tedious setting up the tripod for every little little thing. So there's tons of work that goes into YouTube, but I, I, I think I'm committed to to having a bigger presence just because uh you know just like we had the website had the website to replace the forums because the forums weren't doing it we had the book to replace the website because the website wasn't doing it. in some ways you know they're different mediums for sure. different purposes though now we have video for the people that don't like to read and you know, <laughs> you know it, it's also just you know you can turn on video and and watch it anywhere um you know you can re-watch videos multiple times it's a little more fun than reading articles um and youtube just has a built-in audience so you know with knife steel nerds you've got to go to my website you can sign up for emails like who's going to do that um where with youtube a lot of people just go to youtube you know they they go there and like okay i'm gonna watch a few videos and it'll feed you what it thinks you want so yeah and you, know. you were talking about education before and that is where uh you know that's where i go for education on just about anything you know you want to install uh, install a new toilet Go to YouTube, check it out. You want to learn how to heat treat? Go to YouTube, check it out. You know, no matter what it is, YouTube University has the answer. So I think that's probably a... Uh, yeah, and and oh. some of the uh, heat treating content on YouTube is not that good, believe it or not. <laughs> so we, I'm not surprised to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can do a little bit better. Uh, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm exploring that. I don't know exactly what direction this is going to go. And I made one video and then I'm going to make another one video and we'll, we'll build from there. Um, I'll, I'll try to do some non heat treating things. I think my next one's also going to be heat treating, but, uh, the, the thing that people have wanted from me for the beginning is just a ranking and rating of different knife steels. So I'd, I'd like to do that in the, in the future also. Well, Laren, thank you so much for coming back on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was a it was a pleasure to to reconnect with you, and and uh, this time I felt like I was following you almost the entire way through when you, were, <laughs> when you were really getting in the in the weeds. I know for you that was just a a glancing blow, but but I I really you know I think you do have a facility for educating and keeping it as simple as it needs to be in the moment to to get your point across. And this is complicated stuff, so I applaud you for that, sir. Thank you. I'm doing my best. It's hard without pictures. So when you're just when you're just talking, uh, you know, trying to describe what perlite looks like is a real challenge with just your fingers. But it, it look, <laughs> looks kind of like that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, Laren. Well, take care, sir. We look forward to seeing what comes comes out of that brain next. Take Thanks, care, Bob. My pleasure. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. There he goes, Laren Thomas. Check out KnifeSteelNerds.com. Check out his new YouTube channel and uh, also his book, Knife Engineering, Steel, Heat Treat, and Geometry. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting mine. And I'm also looking forward to getting my first knife with Magna Cut Steel on it. Uh, if you like this show and you want to see others like it, check us out every Sunday right here for another uh, interview. And also we have our Wednesday supplemental shows, Thursday night live streams, and uh, you can check this all out on your favorite podcatcher. If you want to find liner notes to the show, I call them liner notes. I, I keep saying that. If you want to find show notes to the show, just go to the knifejunkie.com slash 
242. 242 is the episode number, and it'll take you right to the episode. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.